people that are watching online. And uh, please join us. I know all you guys had all that energy um, coming into the sanctuary. Now um, we ask you to use that energy to uh, help us praise our great God with the first song that is called It Is Well With My Soul.
good night. I'm going to start saying hi to you guys. Happy evening. Happy evening. Yeah. Listen, anybody know the importance of today? Your, your world is so small. Your world is so small. Listen, in 1960, today was the first presidential debate ever. Between, you, do you remember who it was? Between Kennedy and Nixon. Do you remember who won? Who won the debate? Kennedy won the debate. Yeah, this guy, bright mind right here. So Nixon and Kennedy had their debate, 1960, the first presidential, presidential debate in the US. I know we're going into a voting season, and I know you're all disappointed that, well, many of you are disappointed that you're, you're too young to vote, but the journey of tonight and the journey of this week is that you're not too young to make a decision who's Lord of your life. So while you, you'll have to miss out, or many of you will miss out on the presidential, which you already know isn't hardly worth your effort, but this is worth your effort to choose Lord of your life. So I want to invite you to, to pray with me, and then we're going to do the drawing of the tickets. And Elijah is going to grab those tickets. Yep, can you do that? And uh, we'll pray together, and we'll draw those tickets. Father in heaven, thank you that you are willing to be Lord of our life, that you are willing to come into us and to provide for us, and that your promises are forever faithful. Well, tonight, we know that man's promises, presidential candidate or not, are weak and miserable like ropes of sand. But tonight, you are, yours are not. Yours are good and faithful and strong. And so tonight, we lay hold of your promises. May it be through the story and through the narrative that we lay hold of the truth that you have for us tonight. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right. And so what happens is we draw these two. Now, if you're watching online, uh, do we have a text number up there? You can text 970-279-3432 and one entry will be selected. So if you're watching online, text 970-279-3432 and uh, you will be selected and we'll get you a gift. These are resources, these gifts. They're not prizes in the sense of uh, just entertaining, but they are resources to bless you and your family. All right, 988, that makes us all winners right there. 5735. <laughs> oh, we were so close. All right, so this is ticket number one that and so afterwards, <laughs> she's totally distracted now. After, somebody around her tell her that afterwards she can go to the resource table. All right, there you go. All right, here we go. 988, so far so good, right? 5751. Five, oh, we got it. So after, resource table, you get to choose. That's it. That's it for tonight. Thank you, Elijah. Let's sing together our theme song. Do we stand for this? Sure. Let's stand for this theme song.
take a seat. Thank you, musicians, as you clear off tonight. Hey, I want to read for you a scripture text. It's coming from the Gospel of John, the last remaining disciple. He recounts the story of Jesus. John chapter 12. John chapter 12 and verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why hasn't this perfume sold in the... Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's worth at least a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, as keeper whoa, of the money whoa, back. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Who are you calling a thief? Who are you anyway? Uh, just a scripture reader. Yeah, well, just get out of here. All right. Call me a thief. My name is Judas, and it's a perfectly good name. Judas. Some people say a Judas. Like a snake. Well, let me set it straight. I was one of the 12 disciples. My name means, well, it's after Judah, the tribe of Judah. The one who is blessed. The one who is a blessing. And I'm a blessing. By the way, who wrote that, that stuff about me being a thief? Who wrote it? Your friend John. John, my friend. Friend John, calling me a thief? John. What a wimp. John. You know, all these disciples, all of them, they're all Galileans. Galileans have such soft hearts and softer heads. Matthew. You know what Matthew did before he was a disciple? You remember what he did? What was his job? He was what? A tax collector. Who did he? T he collected taxes from us, from the Jews, and gave the money to the Romans. Talk about a thief. He pocketed the difference. He, they had a thing called tax farming. You bid to collect the taxes. And then you collected the taxes more than Rome wanted, and you put the others in your own purse. Call me a thief. Peter. Huh. You know, he says stuff and then he thinks. Oh, let me walk on water. Come on, give me a break. Andrew, quiet, hangs out with kids. Don't you understand? This group of people was never, ever going to amount to anything. Jesus needed me. Judas, the one who is a blessing, the one who's blessed. You see, he had to call all the rest of them. Come follow me, come follow me. I studied the prophecies. I knew that Jesus was a double descendant of the line of David. His father, Joseph, line of David. His mother, Mary, line of David. He fulfilled all the time prophecies of the one who was coming to deliver our people. Deliver them from Rome. But how is he going to do it with this group of Galileans? I'm from Judea. See, I was named after Judas Maccabees. The Maccabees, oh, what a group of people. From 175 to 163 BC, they kicked the Romans out, and we ruled our own country. We minted our own coins, and then the Romans swept us out. And you see, Jesus, I watched him. 
I heard him. I studied him. Oh, he could teach. He could preach. He held people in the palm of his hand. But he'd never make it with this group of disciples. I came to him. He had to call them. I came to him and said, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And he said, birds have nests and the foxes have dens, but the Son of Man doesn't have any place to lay his head. And I thought to myself, yeah, see, that's why he needed me. I have a plan. I always have a plan. All he had to do was follow my plan, and it would work out. We'd kick the Romans out. We'd take over again. And the people of Israel would have a king, and his name would be Jesus. And I was going to make it happen. <laughs> yeah. I was the treasurer. I carried the money. I paid the bills. I bought the food. I accepted the offerings. You see, they didn't make Matthew the treasurer, even though he'd done that professionally. They didn't trust him. They trusted me. Those disciples saw me with wisdom, insight, skill. They needed me. Jesus missed so many opportunities. They just dropped it. The whole bunch. I mean, one time, you probably heard the story, the feeding of the 5,000. All those people, they were following Jesus and he was preaching and teaching. Like I said, he could hold them in the palm of his hand. They didn't even go home to eat. When's the last time you got so involved in someone teaching that you didn't want to eat? Well, Jesus could do that. And then somebody said, well, send them home. And Jesus said, no, you feed them. And they looked at me and they said, we don't have, I said, we don't have that kind of money. We can't feed them. Well, he performed a miracle. Oh, wait a minute. Not only he performed a miracle, I helped it too. My hands held the fish and the bread and passed them out. I was part of the miracle. Anybody here named Judas? Why not? It's a perfectly good name. People named Matthew, John, Andrew. <laughs> Why not Judas? I did miracles. I was one of them. Don't forget, I came to him. He didn't have to call me because I had a plan. That here, here, I'm feeding the people and what an opportunity. See, as I, as I would give people food, I'd say, make him king. Make him king. He could feed our army. Make him king. I want you to help me with that. Say that with me. Make him king. 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 That's what I did. Who do you think started that? Peter, duh. John, oh. No, it was my idea. And the people were ready to make him king. See, when he had the people sit down on the grass, he had them sit in groups of 50s and 100s. Say, well, what's that mean? Oh, don't you get it? That's the grouping of a military unit. 50s and 100s. They were ready to be his army to make him king. And they're chanting, make him king, make him king. And he said, dismiss the people. Then you disciples go across the sea on the boat. And you know what Jesus said he was going to do? He's going to go up into the mountains and pray. Oh. Prayer is okay, but he could have been king, and he goes to pray. Don't you see, he 
needed me. He needed a manager. He needed someone to take charge. It wasn't going to be any of the rest of them. Talk about missing the boat. We were walking. Jesus was teaching. You know, I've got to admit, a lot of things he said made sense. It's just that he needed me to guide him. We're walking along and came toward us. Oh, I love these words. They're like chocolate. There came a rich, young ruler. Oh, say those words with me. What? Rich, young ruler. Now, when you put those words together, he's young, but he's also rich. You're young. How many of you are rich? No, no. Who's, who gets, who's rich? Who's wealthy? It's older people. He must have inherited his money. Rich, young. What's that, what's that other word? Ruler. He has money, he has influence, and he doesn't have a lot of experience. Then he said to Jesus, Good master, what must I do to be saved? Remember what Jesus said? Huh? Sell how much? Everything you have, and I'm saying, yes, sell everything you have, then give it to Judas, and I'll manage it. And Jesus said, sell everything you have and give it to who? Who? The poor. Come on. That's why they're poor. They don't know how to handle money. You're going to give them more? They'll squander it. He should have said, give it to Judas, and he'll manage it. Don't you see? He needed me. Jairus, another ruler, a ruler of the synagogue. Oh, understand that some of the, some of the religious leaders were against Jesus. He was threatening their position and their power. Oh, wait till he becomes king. Then they'll love him. Jairus was the ruler of the synagogue. I knew him. Others knew him. And here he came through the crowd. Jesus was teaching and people were surrounding him. Jairus came and he said, my daughter is ill. She's at death's door. Please come and heal her. Now, that's a big thing for Jairus. Jairus is a ruler of the Jews. And here he's coming to Jesus, whom many of the leaders consider an enemy. Well, you think politics are bitter today. <laughs> they were in my day, too. And Jesus said, I'll go. And then as we were walking, Jesus stopped. And he said, somebody touched me. That's what you call a BFO, a blinding flash of the obvious. He's in a crowd, and somebody touched him? Well, yeah, really, that's what crowds do. He said, no, power went out for me. Someone touched me. And Jairus is standing there on pins and needles. He says, my daughter is dying. He's a man of influence. You've got to pay attention to the people of influence. And Jesus said, no, somebody touched me. And suddenly this, 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 this woman who'd been bleeding, unclean, for 12 years said, I touched you. And I'm thinking, Jesus, don't pay attention to this woman. She's nobody. Pay attention to the people who are powerful, rulers, people who make a difference. Ignore her. Of course, I couldn't say it. 
And Jesus stopped. And listened to her. How long had she been sick? Twelve years. And she told him the whole story. Okay, a test. Your students, you use the test, right? Okay, if I say, if you went to a wedding, describe the wedding. Okay, if I ask guys, describe a wedding, what will guys say? They stood up, they got married, that's a wedding, right guys? Huh? Ask a woman about a wedding, what do you get? Yes, the whole story. How many flowers, what color, how many boards in the floor? The whole story. And Jairus, a man of importance, is standing there with his daughter dying, wringing his hands, and Jesus is paying attention to this woman. Don't you see, they needed me. Oh. Jesus had healed and brought back to life. He, he, he brought back to life Jairus' daughter. That was fine, but look at the trauma he caused. And Jesus had, had brought other people to life. He brought Lazarus to life. And so that's what you were reading about that this John wrote. Simon the Pharisee, by the way, the Pharisees and Sadducees didn't get along with each other. And, and Simon was a leader, another leader. And, and he, had, he had a feast in the honor of Jesus who had raised Lazarus, his nephew, by the way. And in his house was anybody who was anybody in the community. Oh, oh, what an opportunity. You know, I went up to people and I would say, Ah, oh, brother, isn't Jesus a good teacher? Isn't he a good preacher? You know, wouldn't you like to make a contribution? Hey, I'm not going to miss a chance. And suddenly, into this feast, and this merriment, and this celebration, comes this despicable woman. She had this alabaster container and she didn't just open it she broke the container that meant she was giving everything to Jesus now let me tell you something about that perfume it's called nard it's made from a flower that grows way up in the upper reaches of the Himalaya mountains in India that's a long way from where we were. That perfume was used by a special group of women who would sell their bodies. And they would anoint that so that it would mask the odors. And when she broke that open, you could smell it through the whole place. And I looked at Simon, and he was turning beet red. He was embarrassed to have her in his house. She should be out on the streets where she earned the money to buy that nard. It was an embarrassing moment. Somebody had to say something. The other disciples are standing there going... <laughs> I spoke up. This should have been sold and given to the poor. See, one of my jobs as the money keeper was to give money to the poor. Really what I was saying is the money should be sold, the, the, the nard should have been sold and given to me. And do you know what Jesus did? He rebuked me in front of the whole crowd. He said, leave her alone. She's done this 
to anoint me for my burial. Oh, burial. He's always talking about dying and death. He rebuked me. He said, you'll always have the poor with you. You won't always have me. Who is he to rebuke me? It was just clear that Jesus wasn't going to do what he needed to do. I had a plan. I always have a plan. Passover was coming. He sent Peter and John to get things ready. Peter and John, dumb and dumber. They didn't do what they were supposed to do. Nobody to wash our feet. When it came time to do that, people started looking around and said, hey, whoa, I don't do feet. No. And Jesus started to wash our feet. You know, he started with me. He started with me. Because I'm important. And I'm thinking, how in the world is this man ever going to declare himself king of Israel when he's washing people's feet? But see, I had a plan. I'd worked before. I'd gone to the leaders and I'd said, look, I know you want to uh, <clears throat> talk with Jesus. I can tell you where he'll be. But there'll be a finder's fee of 30 pieces of silver. They were glad to pay it. Don't you see, I have a plan. <laughs> I'm going to set it up so Jesus will have to declare himself king. If he won't do it on his own, I'll set it up. All he needs is a little push. He needed me. We were eating, and I was dipping the bread in the third cup, the cup with herbs, the cup of blessing. My name Judas, the one who's blessed, the one who's a blessing. <laughs> How propitious. And as I was dipping it in, suddenly everybody went, <gasps> And they were all looking at me, and Jesus said, Judas, do what you need to do. Do it quickly. Ah, maybe he understood. Maybe he got it. Maybe he finally understood the time was right for him to say he was king. And when he does, I'll be a hero because I set it up. They needed me. He needed me. Oh, the others, they thought Jesus meant for me to go out and give money to the poor. I've already told you, the poor are poor because they don't know how to handle money. Why squander it on them? They don't deserve it. I went out. Got the temple people, the guards, the high priest. We went to the Garden of Gethsemane. I knew Jesus would be there. When we came to the garden, they were afraid of him. They knew he'd heal the dead. They knew he had power. I knew he had power. He just wasn't using it the way I wanted him to use it. There was a flash of light and everybody fell back. And I had a sign. I said, no, you follow my lead. I went up and I put my arms around Jesus. And it's Kiss on one cheek, kiss on the other. It's a typical Middle Eastern greeting. And then Jesus said to me, friend, why are you here? He called me friend, don't forget that. And then they came forward and they tied his hands. I knew they'd try that. The moment of truth. Now he's in a bind. He has to declare himself who he is. And suddenly, 
Peter came roaring out of the dark, dumb Peter with his little fisherman sword, knife, starts swinging it around, cut off the right ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest. Stupid Peter. And then Jesus' hands were free. Yes, he was doing it. He was freeing himself. I knew he would. When they tried to get him in, in Nazareth and throw him over the cliff, he walked through the crowd and he did it again. He's right on cue with what I told him, set him up to do. He's free. He reached down and picked up Malchus's ear, put it back on. And then he let them tie his hands again. Then they began to beat him. No, Jesus, don't you understand? This is your hour. This is your time. Follow my plan. But he didn't. They let him off. They were going to turn him over to the Romans. He was supposed to free us from the Romans. I went back to Caiaphas and I said, here, take your money. I don't want it. He's innocent. And they said to me, that's your problem. You're going to kill him. And you'll blame me. And you'll never name your kids or your grandkids Judas. All I had to do was follow my plan. No, don't look at me that way. If you've ever said, I've got a plan, God bless my plan, you're just as much Judas as I am. I can't watch him die. Oh, I have a plan. I have a plan. I'll die first. <laughs> right here. This tree. I'll die first. I'll take my own life. Oh, you've prayed with a lot of people. Have you ever prayed with Judas before? Shut your eyes. Shut your eyes. Give me a little peace. Give me some respect. Shut your eyes. All of you. God, if there's a God, I don't even know if there is. I don't even know if I care. It's too late for me. Maybe I should have been listening and following rather than telling him what to do. God, I don't care anymore. I don't care. It's too late for me. Maybe not for somebody else. For me, it's all over. One of the most sobering passages that I've read in this classic book on the life of Christ, The Desire of Ages, written about Judas, I'm going to read to you one line. Here's the first sentence of that chapter. The history of Judas 
presents the sad ending of a life that might have been honored of God. Let me read that line to you again. The history of Judas presents the sad ending of a life that might have been honored of God. What could have been Judas's life? What might have been his life if he chose to honor God instead of himself? You know, there was an article written in July 2019 by Lydia Son. What do 90-somethings regret most? This is what Lydia said. She said these words as she interviewed these 90-year-olds. I was intrigued to learn that their biggest regrets had little to do with their careers, missed opportunities, or things they didn't achieve. Rather, their pain came from failures in their relationships. And here were their top two regrets, these 90-year-olds. One, they regretted not cultivating closer relationships with their children. Number two, they regretted not putting their children on the right path of life. What regrets do you have? I know, the reg I know the regrets that I have. I remember the days where I would spend hour after hour wasting my life away playing video games when I was a teenager, thinking to myself, I could be spending my time doing useful things. It wasn't until age 19, you know, I grew, up, I grew up in Christian church and Christian school and Christian tradition, but it was not until age 19 when I learned of this loving Jesus that I finally said, Jesus, you gave all, so I give all of my life to you. And I, I had this new birth experience at the age of 19, and oh, how I wish I would have known Jesus before I hit my teens. It would have saved me from the pain and the mistakes and the habits that I formed. It would have saved me. Oh, how much I regret that. But what about within the spiritual realm? The regret of not choosing Jesus earlier. What could have been in my life if I would have chosen Jesus earlier? And here is the worst regret of all in spiritual terms. You know, the Bible speaks about a resurrection at the end of time of those who believed in God, who chose to have a relationship with God, and there's also another resurrection of those who chose not to have a relationship with God. And at the end of time, the worst regret will be those at the end who come up and rise in the wrong resurrection and say, I wish I would have chosen to have a relationship with Jesus, and now it's too late. Regrets. Let me read to you this line from Judas. Because we have to ask, what, 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 what's up with him? What's going on? Why did, he, why did he take his life? Why was he so stubborn? Matthew 27, verse 3, Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. And he said this, please listen. I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. Why was it that this man Judas hung himself? Judas was sorry for what he did 
because he feared the consequences of his decision. Judas could not take the fact that he was going to suffer the consequences of what he did. Let me give you an example. There are many people who do something wrong. They commit a sin. They commit a mistake. And because they're scared of the consequences of their action, that I might get in trouble, or I might get expelled from school, or I might get a disease, or I might hurt someone's feelings, or whatever the, the reason is, people come and they say to God, I'm sorry, not because they've hurt God, but because they're scared of the consequences of their actions. And this is exactly what Judas did. But then this man, Peter, who we learned about yesterday, he said, Jesus, I will never deny you. And you know the rest of the story. He denied Jesus three times. And the Bible says that Peter wept bitterly. Why? Not because he was scared of the consequence of rejecting Jesus. Peter, unlike Judas, was so heartbroken that he hurt his friend Jesus. You see, the difference between Peter and Judas Judas didn't love Jesus. He loved his power and his authority and his riches. And he was scared of the consequences of his actions. But Peter, on the other hand, this is a man who had a real relationship with Jesus. He was broken. And he was sorry not for what he had done, but he was sorry for hurting his friend. You see, the difference between Judas and Peter is that Peter had a humbling, thriving relationship, a humbling relationship with Jesus. And so, friend, those of you who are watching online, friends who are sitting here, why wait? Why wait and say, hey, I'm young. I'm going to sow my wild oats. I'm going to have fun. And later on in life, I'm going to come back to Jesus. But friends, two things. One, tomorrow's not promised. Secondly, a life without Jesus is not as happy as a life living with Jesus. And Paul said, last verse, and then I'm done. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, he says, Now is the day of salvation. He doesn't, he doesn't say tomorrow. He says, now is the day of salvation. So friend, why wait? Why put off another, another day? Why put off another minute? When this Jesus spilled his innocent blood for you. And so maybe someone here is saying, yeah. I don't want to live like Judas. Rather, I choose today to live in a humbling relationship with the one who spilled his innocent blood for me. Is that your desire? How about you watching online? We're going to put the connect number on the screen here. Next slide. Maybe there's someone here who's saying, I've fallen. I've messed up. I don't want to be like Judas. I want a real relationship now. I want to come and confess my sin, repent, turn from my evil ways, go to the God who loves me, fall into his loving arms, the one who died for me. If it's your decision, your desire to walk with him, I want to invite you to stand with me. Even if you're watching online, stand with us. Stand in your, your, your living room. Maybe you're watching in your bedroom. Stand with us. And friend, if you're watching online and you're sensing, I want a new start with this Christ, text that number, 970-279-3432. We'd love to get in touch with you. Because nothing is more important to us than knowing that you are walking with Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the story, the reminder that life is not worth living if we don't humbly have a relationship with Christ. 
And so we pray that we would not be like Judas and worship our status, worship ourselves, worship our power, worship our money. But like Peter, we would humble ourselves, that we would weep bitterly at your feet, realizing that you have spilled your innocent blood for us because you love us so much. And so would you be with us who are standing, those who are watching online. Be with us, Father, as we believe and receive Christ in all his glory and all his majesty and all his power. In the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. Friend, thank you for joining us. On